Area 52. Sighting in UFO sighting in Cornwall in 1965. Joan Vincent, along with her husband Roy, would witness a UFO over the skies of Cornwall one evening in 1965. It was a sighting they would keep secret to all but close family till 1998, when they would finally speak of the encounter. Perhaps it's Joan Vincent's long standing position as a county councillor that encouraged her to maintain her silence. At a time when most people were they were crazy if they were to speak of such encounters, it is easy to understand why the sightings remained the Vincent family secret for so long. At the time of the sighting in nineteen sixty five, the Vincent's family home was in Stain L E S S T E N A L E E S, a rural area of Cornwall. It was late one evening that the couple were driving home on the largely empty country roads. According to Joan, they had been driving for around fifteen minutes when suddenly it was as if a light had been switched on outside. She would further tell how they would see for miles over the fields and open countryside. Such was the brightness of the light. The area they were driving through had a well-known reputation in recent years for being a place where flying saucers could be seen. Many students would hold all-night vigils in hopes of seeing one of these cosmic visitors. With that in mind, the Vincents were already sure of what was unfolding around them. As they scanned their surroundings from the inside of their vehicle, Joan would notice a dome-shaped glass-like object that seemed to be hovering behind a large edge in a nearby field. Joan would explain three decades later that the hedge was so thick that neither of us know if it was hovering or resting on the grass. A light appeared to be emanating from inside the dome it, itself on top of the object. They were laid to estimate the craft to have been between 50 to 60 feet in length, around 40 feet high. Joan would state that inside the dome she could see big cabinets with dolls on them. The material around the dome was more solid and metallic. It was a green, grey greenish colour and contained several hot hole, portholes. The couple remained motionless, staring at a magnificent sight for what seemed like minutes. In reality, it was merely 30 seconds. Then Joan urged her husband to get us out of here. Roy did as his wife requested and pressed down on the accelerator and he sped off from the screen scene. Once home, each would approach the sighting with very business-like mindsets. They'd each go into separate rooms to draw the object they'd seen. Once they would c- done, they would compare the sketches. Not surprising, they were practically identical. While they couldn't explain what they'd seen, they could at last read out in their own minds what that it was some kind of bizarre hallucination. They would, however, make the decision to keep them, the, the matter to themselves. They would tell only their son and Joan's mother. Also, unfortunately, both passed away before the couple went public with the account. Consequently, no investigation would take place. Perhaps most unfortunate is no further corroborating witnesses were found who very well might have been seen the events from a different vantage point. The Vincents returned to the field the following day, but would find no evidence of what they'd seen. They only further strengthened their conviction that they would keep the matter to themselves Incidentally, the field where the sighting took place is now a soil tip for then the newly built industrial estate. Furthermore, the road where the Winsters would view events from their stopped car also no longer exists as it was rerouted during the developments of the further following decades. While we must le- might learn any more about this particular sighting, both at the location of the year are of interest for UFO researchers.
further sightings in southern England. On the afternoon of 5th of January of 1965, came the sighting of, of Max Barren. He would write to his accountant in March, Cambridgeshire, to the Metrological Office Unit. He would claim that the object resembled a curved parachute. Although it was moving far too quickly, it remained visible while in the sunlight, suggesting the object was metallic and reflecting the sun's rays. Though Benin didn't at any point insulate that the object was extraterrestrial, he would end his initial letter by simply asking, what would the object have been? No such reflection was ever offered to Benin's request, at least none that was undoubtedly explained the object. On the 14th of September, about just after 1am, 29-year-old engineer Paul Green would see a thing in the sky overhead. He was returning home on his motorbike, following a visit to his fiancée's home. He was travelling at around 40 miles per hour alongside, aside from a scooter which he overtook, with no other traffic on the roads. He approached Lingman Hall. He noticed a high-pitched humming heading towards the, from his left-hand side. Green glanced upwards, expecting to see a small aircraft overhead. However, he, he would see nothing but the black of a night sky. He did, though, pick out a small pinpoint of blue light in the same direction humming appeared to be emanating from. The light was blinking and off, on and off and was now getting increasingly larger and increasingly quicker. Realising it was heading in his direction at considerable speed, he noticed the humming was also increasing in volume. In fact, the closer it got, the more it took on the sound of a high-pitched buzz. Just as he began to complete, increasing his speed, his bike began to cough and splutter. Several seconds later, it stopped dead and lights went out. He turned to his face the sound, noticing the object was now only a mile of so away, it's spinning and it moved, it resembled a hot under half of a light, large spinning top. On the top of the object was a dome that appeared to be sending out blue flashing lights. As the object descended, Green noticed from the underside of the craft contained numerous round objects, some of which appeared to glow. He stepped from his bike and began, and began, began in the object's direction. However, within a few steps, he suddenly was unable to move, nor could he speak or call out for help. He was paralysed, something with, that is quite common in close contact UFO encounters. He continued to watch the object as he remained unable to move. A flashing light increased in brightness till it hurt his eyes to look at it. He would also feel the light hit against his chest. He stood motionless. He noticed a scooter. He had passed a, earlier his engine cut out dead. The rider of the now crippled scooter stepped off the vehicle while, the, while staring at disbelief at the awesome sight in front of him. In, in fact, so engrossed was he with the growing craft that he didn't notice Green stood just a few yards up from him. Green then realised he was beginning to gain some movement in his limbs. He began to concentrate on moving from where he stood. It was taking all his effort he could muster, but slowly he was able to move. As soon as he regained his strength to take steps from where he stood, he picked up his bike and began to push it away from, from the bizarre scene. After several steps, he decided to give the engine a try. As it roared into life, he quickly sat on it, revved it up once or twice, and sped away from the glowing craft. The following, further away he got, the light became dimmer. He was, was able to... It still visible for some time. What came with the rider and the scooter, or who he was, remains unknown. By the time Green arrived, it after 2 a.m., his head throbbed from the experience, and it showed fright and adrenaline rushed through him. The following day, he noticed how his clothes from the previous season were rid- 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 riddled with static. They would even crackle as he moved them. He, he-, he would 
as with his hair, as he ran his hand through it, over it. Perhaps the most interesting, though, was an unintentional collaboration witness in a friend who discussed the incident with a few days later. According to his friend, a little after 1 a.m., his dog suddenly came very agitated at the front door house. He opened the door to let him out into the garden. As he did so, a large blue light passed by rapidly, threateningly over his property. The two friends would figure out that he was heading in the direction that Green was travelling in. It was almost certainly the same object. Whether these sightings share a connection, the sighting of Joan and Ray Vincent is unknown. It is, however, not much a stretch of imagination to share this. It. While all such sightings could have became more sporadic in the years following 1965, in certain areas would have attained a higher than usual rate. One of those areas was Cornwall, and the sightings would continue well into the 21st century. You have been listening to Area 52. Sightings in Cornwall in 1965. And... Sightings in Southern England in 1965. Thank you for listening.